trying to turn my background off. <laughs> it's You're recording now. Stone. Um, I hit record if you want to call the meeting to order. Okay. And uh, Scott's going to be, he's going to come, but he's running late. All right. So go ahead and he said, go ahead and start without him. Great. Let's call the land use committee uh, meeting of February 10th to order. Um, we need to skip the first item until uh, Scott's here. So let's start with item two. All right, Zach Holt, uh, this is your presentation. Sure. Do you um, need permission to share something? Uh, the flyer that came out in the packet is basically what I'm reading from uh, without going into the details of the entire plan. Um, it's mostly for me to just give you guys some basic information on what we've been discussing in the committee meetings and what we will be proposing to council to approve for ecology. So um, with that, I'm just going to dive into it a little bit here and uh, take some questions at the end if you guys have any. So we've been convening for about two and a half years with different jurisdictions regionally within the water resources inventory area 15, which is Kitsap County and some parts of Mason County um, and some parts of King County as well. Um, Vashon is included. Um, so there are several different go governments involved, tribes are involved in cities. Um, this committee is based upon the Hearst decision. I'm sure many people are familiar with Hearst. Um, as a local jurisdiction, we are invited to this planning effort, but it really doesn't affect us because we have municipal water sources that are deep water aquifer. It's more intended for permit exempt wells and surface water drawdowns that regionally affect streams, wetlands, et cetera. Um, so based on Hearst and Foster, this committee was um, convened and we've been meeting for the last two and a half years to discuss how to move forward to make a plan to manage what the result of Hearst and Foster were. Um, through these series of meetings, we've come to a general consensus for review in the plan. And we're at the stage now where jurisdictions are going to be, electeds are going to be reviewing this plan for approval and uh, resubmittal to ecology. If we do not reach 100% consensus on this plan, the plan is then defaulted under RCW 9094-030 to ecology to be written. So we've all been working pretty hard to make sure that it's our decisions that are being involved in this. Um, really, it's our, again, our role is minor in this. It does have some regional impacts for wetland enhancement, et cetera, but it's mostly flow improvement projects, habitat restoration, et cetera, to try and mitigate for um, the uh, permit exempt wells. So it doesn't really, again, tie in with any of our mitigation requirements, et cetera, under foster and our drinking water rights. So I guess with that, if you guys have any questions, I can keep this fairly succinct. This doesn't affect the residences who are running on well water, does it? I'm not aware that we have any residences within city jurisdiction that do, but I can refer to Jackie Mass or Jackie Brown and find out uh, from her if we do have any. I think there may be a couple. Um, if they're already existing, it shouldn't affect them. This is mostly driven towards new development. Okay, that sounds good. Okay. Um, I'm good. Yeah. Oh, if anybody has any questions, feel free to contact me and I can follow up with any of the detailed stuff. Um, it is a very large plan document, which is why we've got these summary documents included here. So um, please feel free to dive into anything if you have any questions or want to know more or reach out to me and I can supplement as needed, of course. Thank you. Absolutely. Okay. Um, let's go to item number three. All right. Um, the next item is the comprehensive plan amendments for 
2021. And so every year we have an opportunity to amend the comprehensive plan uh, and the applications have to be submitted by the end of January. And so as of the end of January, 2021, uh, we had several amendments. Most of them are, are city initiated amendments. And then one of them was a privately uh, submitted amendment. Um, I'll talk about the private amendment first. I, I can't remember which order they appear in your packet, but um, a Mr. He owns property near the China Buffet on Bethel. And it is, um, he has a large chunk of commercial property that is zoned. Uh, I believe it's either commercial heavy or commercial corridor along the frontage of Bethel. And then on the rear part of the property, it is zoned commercial mixed use, which allows for commercial or multifamily development. There are some critical areas that separate the front of the project from the back of the project. And so he also acquired another site off of Salmonberry to provide better access to the rear of the property. But the property he acquired on Salmonberry has different zoning than the rear portion of his commercial site. And so he is seeking a comprehensive plan designation change uh, and a zoning change that would allow him to develop all of these properties more consistently on the back half uh, of that site. So that's um, uh, pretty typical that we see a, a handful of, of zoning changes every year. In terms of city initiated comp plan amendments, we do have amendments to the city's capital facility plan uh, to address uh, city projects that are uh, planned in the coming years and that they have to be in our capital facilities plan in order for us to spend certain types of money for those projects. And so we're referencing the, uh, the city hall project, the community event center, um, and I, there may be one or two other projects on the list. I, I haven't had a chance to look real closely at this. Um, we're also um, proposing to adopt the new parks plan, which is still being written. However, we would like to adopt it as an appendix to the comprehensive plan. Uh, and so presumably the parks plan will be finished this spring in time for comp plan adoption this summer. Um, we also have prepared a draft McCormick Village sub area plan that we would like to adopt. It's similar to the Ruby Creek sub area plan. Uh, you will see a draft version of that plan in your packet. It's still very rough. We haven't inserted all of the graphics yet, and we still have quite a bit of graphic design work to do uh, on that, as well as some public outreach. But we're generally following the same path that we followed on the Ruby Creek neighborhood plan in terms of um, kind of organization of the document and overall uh, project goals, because I, I think whether you're in Ruby Creek or the McCormick Village Center, your priorities are probably pretty similar, um, but we'll still go through the process and truth that with the community. Uh, and feel free to stop me if you have any questions as we, we go through these. I just have a request for Carrie. Um, the packet is, I know this month's packet is huge. Is there any way that page numbers could be added? Um, so for example, I would know where or what page the <laughs> complement amendment starts on. Because uh, I, I, I know you can't do it right now, but maybe in future um, when there are packets, if... It, sure. It's sort of the way the, the main uh, agenda, we have page numbers so we at least know where to go uh, to find the next item. Because these are all running together. I mean, I'm looking at capital facilities. I'm thinking, okay, that's not the right one. Or the parks plan that Nick just mentioned. And are you um, are you using a paper copy or, or a PDF? Yes, it is a paper copy. <laughs> okay, I, I can tell you what page of the PDF it is, um, but I don't have uh, I don't what's have a. Page? What page of the PDF? I could get a rough idea. Wh which project are you asking about? So the one you're just talking about, <laughs> um, the McCormick Village sub area plan. Yes. Yes. Um, let me scroll down here. Shame on you, Fred. That's a, that's more than a ream of paper you have in your hand for. Well, it is printed on two sides. Uh, uh, it's page 160 of the okay. packet. It, it, it's right after the parks plan. Okay. Um, you'll, you'll find a section on the McCormick Village plan. And it's, like I said, it's still a very rough draft. And we, you know, there's still uh, tables from the Ruby Creek plan that for showing the land capacity analysis, which we will fill in the correct information as that plan is developed. But um, generally it, it, uh, seeks to achieve a, a lot of similar goals. Okay. Um, the, the next amendment that I had on my list was there are two properties on Sydney near the intersection of Taylor. 
And we've had um, the, the couple that owns that property has come to several planning commission meetings and I think a city council meeting or two. And they were given a residential mixed use zoning when we re redid our comp plan and zoning map a few years ago. And they are insistent that they only want a residential zoning. They don't want the ability to have commercial development on their property. And so even though the commercial zone does allow the development of a single family home on their vacant lot, um, they're worried that they're going to be taxed as commercial property rather than as residential and it conflicts with their, um, their future plans. So I have submitted this as a city sponsored amendment because we were the ones who initiated that change uh, a year or two ago. Um, and so we can consider taking that up this year and reverting that back to the old zoning. This was one I think where there was an inconsistency between the comp plan and the zoning. And so we followed the comp plan and changed the zoning to be residential mixed use, but they would have preferred that they kept the zoning and got a new residential comp plan designation. So um, this is one where we're just trying to uh, uh, make people happy and Realistically, we're, we're also fixing their property in the downtown sub area plan because they are in the, the sub area plan boundary. And so they just wanted to be doubly sure that if for some reason that didn't get completed, that, that they would still uh, be able to get their, their property changed back to the previous zoning. Can so we, I've got a question. Can we back up to the China Sun property? Yeah. That Is region on the backside there, would that still allow a car, car dealership? No, it's commercial mixed use. It doesn't allow, it allows apartments or um, some retail uses, but really lower intensity type things that are more compatible with Would the new zoning have. allow for that? Carrie, um, I know that you're, you just came from the dentist, but uh, do you recall what the, what Mr. He has requested for that zoning designation? I haven't looked closely at the application yet. Um. Mr. He, sorry, everyone, I have no vacane. <laughs> you sound fine. We need to get you. would like to see the more. video, actually. Yeah, no, absolutely not. <laughs> um, he is requesting a residential designation. Um, I think R3, he wants to do apartments. Okay, so he. I think he's currently R1 or R2 along Salmonberry. I'll go ahead and show my share my screen so that you can see where we're talking about. Um, his property is on is on Salmonberry and it connects through to this large piece that goes all the way to Bethel. And mm -hmm. so the Crawford Road properties are kind of to the bottom of the page here. I'm familiar with this. So what what it's contiguous though to his large parcel. Yes. So you can see here the large parcel is this big um, commercial rectangle here. And okay. I mentioned the zoning on the front on Bethel is, uh, I, I didn't include the zoning map. I think it's commercial heavy on Bethel, but it's commercial mixed use on the back. And there's a wetland running right through the middle of it. So he owns this little piece of residential low on Salmonberry, and he would like residential medium so that he can uh, have an apartment complex coming off of Salmonberry and extending into the rear of the big property. Okay. So it's the, it's the, piece off Salmonberry that he's wanting to rezone. Correct. And that's in the not, city. Not affecting the pet. That's, that's in the city, yes. Okay. Is, is there any reason we couldn't make it commercial like the rest of his parcel? Wouldn't be consistent, because this is the piece that's next to the Crawford stuff. Well, you, you could, um, but that's not what he has requested. Okay, all right. And, well, and <laughs> but would it be the only residential medium in that area? I, I'm sorry, the map is so small on my screen. <laughs> yeah, I can try to zoom in here. Um, let me... I'm looking on my phone. Oh, that's better. Thank you. Um, or it was better. Oh, yeah. Um, so so the property is is this, uh, I'm sorry, this rectangle just below Crawford Road that's uh, the red rectangle here. And oh. so the, the piece that he wants, my cursor is on it. It's I just see. one okay. parcel that would create a, a panhandle that connects through to Salmonberry. Um, it sounds like whatever we do there would be different than the area. Is yeah. that whole area? I mean, what are the, the other areas? Residential? Well, it's, it's residential medium across the street. I see. And, okay. and that's the Thimbleberry townhomes. So there's right. already okay. some townhome development nearby. Okay. Um, it's, 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 I, I don't have an objection to it. Um, we'll see what the neighbors say and um, well, do the review. 
I don't object either, but doesn't it make sense if the area south of Salmonberry is all the same zoning? Like if we make it all like the thimble, all residential medium? Yeah, we, we, could certainly, we could certainly look at doing that. Some that skinny lots like? there. Yeah, they're long and skinny, so they're hard to develop in terms of bringing a road into those properties. But they'd be surrounded by apartments anyway. I, I don't know. It's just an, it, it, to, to my mind, it would look better on the map if they were all the same color like residential <laughs> medium. But uh, practically speaking, I understand what you're saying. Um, we, we will make the uh, Planning Commission aware of your concerns, and they may come back with a recommendation to do what you're talking about. So we'll, we'll look at it. Thank you. All right. So Nick, could we talk just a moment more about the Sydney and the landowner who is fearful of being taxed at a commercial rate? Yes. Um, wouldn't they, uh, if it was residential development, by law be taxed as, as a residence? Yes, but currently the property is vacant. So it's, um, it's they're planning on building their dream home on the house next to the, they, they own a house, um, one house is on an existing lot and then they have a big vacant lot that they intend to build their dream house on. And so once the house is built, yes, I believe they would be taxed as, uh, as for the use, but because it's commercial right now, I think the county is taxing them as commercial. Okay, I see that. And for the record, they own a lot behind their house too. I don't know which one it is. Okay. Um, they have a garage back there, they, a huge garage. They, they basically brought their... I mean, it's great. They they have like Seattle type development. Um, it is an empty lot where there used to be a house, and uh, they're interesting people. Um, yeah, yeah, very friendly, and they've they've been coming to all the planning commission meetings, so they have uh, quadrupled quadrupled our attendance for the year. I think. All right, so I think that was the extent of the comp plan amendments. Um, the obviously the. The, the tip gets updated every year. I think I mentioned that. Um, so we can move on to the next agenda item unless you have further questions about uh, what was in your packet. And obviously the parks plan, I'm gonna have a separate discussion about that. And um, so we can, we can get into that a little bit more on the, the uh, further down the agenda here. That sounds good to me. And I pass the baton back to Scott for item four. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry I'm late. I did not expect the uh, the high school to be so busy for picking up materials. It's amazing how many kids are running around. It was actually kind of good to see some sense of normalcy there, but uh, it, it was a long line and time got away from me, so I apologize. All right, so the, the next item on the agenda was the countywide planning policies, and I included a copy of the marked up version that I returned to the consultant who is helping KRCC with this effort. Um, if you'll recall, uh, I believe that uh, the mayor or council member Ashby reported that the KRCC hired a consultant to help review and update the countywide planning policies to be consistent with the regional growth strategy vision 2050. And so that work is underway now and the planning directors from all of the cities as well as the uh, transportation folks uh, are reviewing and updating the countywide planning policies to, to ensure consistency. So just real high level, um, you know, eventually the city council will be asked to ratify this, which means that you'll, you'll pass a vote. And I think four out of the five jurisdictions have to pass it with, well, the county and three jurisdictions have to pass it before the uh, amendments will take effect. And so this will come to you at some point in the future when it is done. And so um, I'm checking in with the land use committee now just to see if you have any major concerns. Um, the document is organized into chapters and the, um, I'm, I'm just gonna talk chapter by chapter. Um, element A didn't have a whole lot of revisions. It, it's, it contains the vision um, for the, the county that was written by uh, KRCC. And I think that was updated fairly recently. Um, and most of the changes that are included, I didn't have uh, a whole lot of objection to, although I did, I did flag one item. And if, first of all, um, council member Chang, since you asked previously, I'm on page 247 of the packet and that is page 11 of the countywide planning policies document. Okay. Thank you. I found it. Yeah. So th there's a comment I highlighted in purple there that says, um, 
as part of our vision, balancing historical patterns of growth with a preferred vision of the future and legal requirements is an ongoing challenge. Trade-offs must be made to balance the costs with the gains flexibility uh, necessary to adopt to changing conditions. And so when I read that, it, it sort of sounded like the vision for Kitsap County is that we are not going to comply with legal requirements. <laughs> and it kind of raised some concerns in my mind to say that are, are we really saying that we're going, that if, if our desire to balance historical patterns of growth uh, is in conflict with legal, legal requirements, we will make trade-offs is, is kind of how it reads to me. And so I flagged that as being potentially problematic. I know that Kitsap County also is different than the other three counties and, and we are, uh, that is something you hear frequently at KRCC meetings. Uh, however, I don't know that we have that kind of flexibility. Um, that's, I'm glad you noted that because I would say that that happens a lot where the county seems to neglect some of their obligations. Sure. Scott, plug your ears. <laughs> <clears throat> um, moving on to the, the, just the very next page, page 12 of the countywide planning policies. Um, they, they rearranged some goals and it, it just occurred to me that the, um, what did I say here? Uh, oh, it. there's a heading there. Um, hang on a second. Oh, the heading under CW2 at the end of page 11 refers to the roles of areas outside of cities, but then it talks about, um, it talks about certain policies that just don't fit that heading. And so I, I pointed that out to the county uh, and I'm getting into the weeds a little bit too much. I'm gonna try to go back up a, a few thousand feet. Um, element B, the urban growth area. <clears throat> the, um, the, the big thing that I noticed is that when we are radically changing how, um, how we can go about expanding the urban growth area. And one of the things that concerned me the most was that the if the county commissioners declare a housing emergency, I think is the language that is used, the, the UGA can be expanded by the county without input from the cities or other jurisdictions. And I found that to be highly problematic, not because I don't trust the current county commissioners, but we've seen in other jurisdictions, if you remember Pacific uh, in Pierce County where they had a mayor who was uh, had the police chief try to arrest the clerk and ended up getting thrown in jail, uh, a number of years ago, um, with with needing only two commissioners to take any sort of action, we are one um, strange election away from from having uh, radical change to our urban growth boundaries. And so, I thought that Kitsap or the KRCC involvement should occur in in the declaration of any housing emergency. Where is that specifically discussed? <clears throat> uh, page sixteen, H, and then. Um, subsection seven, Roman numeral seven. So are they adding that? That's a proposed addition. Um, and I don't so like it. Has that been vetted uh, legally, do you know? I, I do not know. I don't like the county doing urban development, period. So this this is very worrisome for me. They're, they wouldn't be, Fred. They're going to expand the urban growth area. Well, but they, so the county will develop it to their standards instead of our standards is my problem yeah. right. or my issue. Right. So they could expand Central Kitsap or Silverdale if they wanted. Um, so yeah, I, I agree. I think this section needs some work. I had a number of comments on this. Uh, for instance, it, it says that if the expansion is supported by a countywide land analysis uh, developed pursuant to this RCW, but the question was, are we actually talking about an analysis performed by the entire county, or if Paulsbo wants to go and prepare their own analysis of the county land, can they justify expanding the urban growth area? So I, I just felt like we are really softening the language dealing with urban growth area expansion and um, I'm going to raise that in my meeting with the uh, Land Use Technical Committee tomorrow. 
it seems ripe for a challenge through the growth management hearings board really um and i guess if the commissioners want to pursue this how they come to a conclusion that there's a critical shortage of affordable housing is going to be very important to understand what that looks like right right uh, on the next page on 17 um it says that to expand an urban growth area an application shall be filed including and it lists the criteria but it doesn't tell you who you're applying to we've had um several several parties or at least one party has come to us repeatedly asking us to expand our urban growth area and we tell them to go to the county and then the county says no and they come back to us wanting us to to fix it and so i think it needs to be clear in this process that it uga expansion does start with an application to the county and um it's not something that the, the cities can file an application with the county but we are not the place that you go to request this sort of thing are you referring to the sydney sedgwick area yeah. yeah, the the uh, Mr. Brown brought us. Uh, yeah, okay. something. Um, moving on, um, I'm going to go to to section three, uh, or section C. We have done, uh, and this begins on page two sixty. It's twenty four of the uh, page numbers in the in this section or in this particular document. So the centers of growth issue. We've been kicking this around for almost uh, two and a half years now. Um, I don't think we're that far from reaching agreement, but one of the things that's been slipped back in here, and my understanding is it's coming from the county transportation department, is that they want there to be a possibility of rural centers. And the reason is that we're prioritizing funding to centers and they want uh, Suquamish, Manchester, all of these areas that are not zoned for urban growth to be prioritized for transportation investment. And so all the city's position has has been that look if if you take the growth where the money should be directed to you if you're not zoned for accommodating that kind of growth uh you should not be prioritizing what limited transportation resources we have to those areas and so i see that the word rural was reinserted into this section i think on page um 29 or 30 um let me find it here um up oh, nope 30 33 so i'm pushing back on that and i've talked to paul's bow and i think the cities agree that that's a non-starter and so um hopefully that will be struck and um if if that were to go forward i mean that's that's the type of thing that i would say the city probably shouldn't ratify this um and then hope that somebody else went along with us because i don't you know my my recommendation is that it is not appropriate to prioritize or to make rural centers in this are consistent with the, the vision 2050 framework what's the driver behind this money money Transfer, yeah. transportation money they, they want well, to make... let me rephrase who's the driver behind this uh you want me to name names oh uh, is it is it public works i mean I, my understanding is it is a transportation uh staffer at the county And I don't know if it's coming from the commissioner's office, but when Jim Bolger was here, he, he, you know, we, we argued about this for a full year. And then finally, when Mr. Uh, when Jeff Remack was hired, he came in and says, Nope, we're dropping this issue. We're not going to push it any further. And my understanding is this has come back from Transpol uh, or TransTAC, the uh, transportation technical committee is saying that they want this. Um, so I think that la the land use technical committee is saying no way. Uh, on the proposed change. Um, moving on to element D, this is rural areas. And again, they've added the language for rural centers. It used to be called rural communities. And so I, I understand that the rural element is a totally separate chapter. And I said, talking about rural centers in element D is not as bad as talking about it in element C, but I think it's still somewhat confusing to use the same term. And so my recommendation is that we we move away from the center's terminology in anything do, dealing with rural areas, with the exception that the, the PSRC has a rural town center and corridor funding program. And so if we want to specifically re reference that program in reference to the areas designated in element D, we should do that. But I don't think we should call them centers for the purposes of um, prioritizing growth and investment, except from this rural pot of money. Um, element E, 
most of the changes in element E are just to comply with vision 2050. There wasn't anything that I objected to. Um, I think the same thing for element D, which talks about development patterns. Um, they did, there is one appendix that was referenced in element D and they've deleted the policy. And so they need to delete the appendix as well, which I pointed out. Um, element G, the siting of public facilities. This is very prescriptive in state law and in vision. And um, I, I didn't have any really substantive changes. The only comment I had was that I know that the PSRC is doing an aviation study for new regional airports that would have commercial operations and that Bremerton is part of that study. And so if Bremerton became a commercial airport at some point in the future, I'm wondering if we need to bolster the policies on page uh, 54 concerning air transportation in Kitsap County. There's a lot of um, height safety regulations that extend across jurisdictional boundaries. And so it seems like we would want to we would want to reference those uh, as it relates to the possibility of that airport seeing increased use either for freight or for uh, commercial operation. But um, we're pretty light on the air transportation policies. Um, element H, transportation. Um, again, I didn't have a whole lot of uh, comments here. Um, there was one particular provision that talks about emergency management and disaster preparation. And to me, when I read that, I thought of my recent experience with the fire district and trying to update the international fire codes. And it is clear from talking to the people who have written this that that is not what they're intending to do, but they understand the confusion. And so I think we're going to clarify that section to, to explain what types of uh, emergency management we are talking about, and that it is not requiring anything above the state mandated fire code uh, in terms of what we're required to adopt. Um, in transportation on page 59 at the very top, there's also um, a policy that says that counties and the city shall develop standards for complete streets. Our understanding is that the county has not done this and so maybe this needs to be clarified that the county will do this in their urban areas only, uh, as opposed to rural areas. But that was an observation that uh, Council Member Ashby uh, had uh, made and shared with me. Um, I'm going to go on. Um, the housing element. Um, we are we have defined affordable housing in or we're proposing to define it in the countywide planning policies. However, I have a couple of concerns. Number one, there's several different definitions that you can use for affordable housing and they, they vary considerably uh, between them. What we are proposing to adopt matches what Pierce County has done. And I certainly understand that. And it is that it's defined as affordable housing households earning up to 80% of the countywide median income. However, in other sections of state law, anything below 80% is actually considered low income housing. And so I think further discussion of this needs to take place. I'm also concerned that the median income for Bainbridge Island and the median income for South Kitsap is very different. And so if right now, as it's proposed, actually, I think Port Orchard is, is getting off fairly easy because nearly everything that is getting built in Port Orchard, at least for the last year or two, with the exception of high-end homes in McCormick Woods has been reasonably affordable relative to median income countywide. However, if we actually had data for the median incomes in Port Orchard, I'm quite sure that it would not be considered affordable. And so um, we, don't, we don't have to do a whole lot to meet affordability thresholds. Um, it is very difficult for Bainbridge Island to hit these um, thresholds. And it, and Bainbridge Island actually benefits from using the average countywide median income as opposed to the Bainbridge Island median income. Um, or I, I, I suppose it, they don't, they, they um, uh, hurt. don't benefit, sorry. So what, well, I think we should remain silent on this issue because it benefits us for a change. Right, I, I think that we remain silent on it, but I'm just, I've pointed out here that the definition he's used, it's actually like three degrees of separation from what is in the state law that is referenced. And so yeah. I just wanted him to clean up his references. Um, let's see here. I think that's really the extent of anything um, 
major that I saw in the policies. Um, and one of the questions I had for this committee was, do you feel that this needs to go to the full council for discussion or are you comfortable with just having this committee's recommendation knowing that council member Ashby and, and the mayor are on the KRCC board? Um, it seems to me that this is a lot uh, to digest as a full council and it's maybe better, better for committees to take it up, but um, at what point should this go to the full council for discussion? Well, when it's fully negotiated, it has to come back to the full council because they have to vote on it. Right. I think sure. it would be worth uh, having a work study on it. Uh, I, I know that it is a lot to digest, but at the same time, bringing uh, council members in at the last moment when it's ready for our co-adoption, I think is a little late and maybe uh, unfair to those members who might want to, um, who might have something to say about this. I don't know how the others feel. No, I agree with that. Okay. Well, I, I concur with that. In that case, I think, I, I know our February agenda is pretty full, but we can look to the March agenda and try to uh, introduce this topic. Um, I will, uh, I'm gonna write an email to Janine right now asking her to put this on the agenda. All right. Um, Nick, I just had a thought um, about the affordable housing. Um, I, I can understand that um, our area sort of benefits from it, but I'm still not sure I'm comfortable with that. Um, occasionally I do hear that for some people who live in our area that there is not of what they consider affordable housing. Um, I don't know that I wanna do anything radical about this, but you did bring up an idea that there may need to be different types of definitions in the county as opposed to one county-wide definition of what affordability is. Yeah, I mean, local jurisdictions could define it for themselves. One of the, actually, on the subject of affordable housing, there is policy language in here. And I think it's a somewhat arbitrary number, but they are saying that we should be targeting 25% of all housing constructed as being affordable to people at 80% 80 or below. And so it's, it's a should, not a shall. And so it's it's probably not enforceable. Um, although I have been, I have been, uh, uh, I, I came in late to an appeal when I was hired on, in my first planning job where the Growth Management Hearings Board did interpret should as meaning you shall do this rather than you have discretion to do it. So, um, so, so putting a policy in there like that, I mean, Bainbridge Island has inclusionary zoning where you're required to create a certain number of units as affordable, but what's affordable to the median income is still pretty expensive, as you as you say. Um, and I think we clarify should early on in this document. We do, yes, absolutely. Um, so, yeah, I think more discussion needs to happen on how we're defining that, but I'm not going to advocate that we make things harder for, for Port Orchard, just that we, we use better terminology. And, um, you know, one of the things that we do that not all of the cities have adopted is our, our multifamily tax exemption. And that actually sets targets that if you're providing studio units, you're targeting 60% of the AMI. And if it's a, if it's a micro unit, it's 40% of the AMI. So we are going above and beyond in terms of the incentives that we offer um, locally. And so, um, another cha a challenge to having our own standards versus something that's countywide is the cost to develop that and the staff time to administer it. Where if we're, we're utilizing a countywide standard, somebody else is creating that data for us. Uh, so I, I, you know, we, we potentially created an, an additional administrative burden if we start making our own Port Orchard standards. I, I would agree with that. I just think, I, I, and I appreciate the discussion on this because I, I think there is certainly a, a, a range of affordability throughout the county that, and I don't know the answer, but it, at least I'm glad that we're, we can show that we're aware of it and we're trying to uh, address it somehow. Right. So um, 
that's all I have on the countywide planning policies. We will aim for a March work study as long as there's room on the agenda. And um, I'll probably have a more updated draft by that time, I would assume anyway. Okay, I think we're ready for the Shoreline Master Program update. All right, and I, um, Carrie is actually the expert on this, but I'm gonna do my best to walk you through it. Um, we are getting pretty close to the finish line on this project. We have to, um, the, the next step in our process, it's, it's been recommended for approval by the Planning Commission, and it is uh, scheduled to go to council for work study in February, and then for a March adoption so that we can send the document to Ecology for approval. Ecology actually has to approve our Shoreline Master Program before it can come back and, and pass for the final time and take effect. So I, I believe our deadline for uh, adoption is in June. And so if we pass it in March, Ecology will have it for a few months. They may come back with uh, a revision or two. Um, probably not, but it's, it's certainly possible. And then we would have to adopt our final ordinance uh, before the 30th of June. So the document, um, you know, we're, we were required to do our periodic shoreline master program update. And the state has adopted new rules periodically since our last update, and they don't require us to adopt the new rules as they're issued. It, it, they're required as we, we hit our periodic update deadlines. And so with this um, June deadline, we are required to catch up on a, a few years worth of, of legislative and regulatory changes coming from the Department of Ecology. So many of the changes in the document have to do with just simply complying with the requirements uh, of the state. Um, as you probably heard, as we went through the community center project, we, we did learn through this process that we did not allow for water enjoyment uses. We had water dependent uses and we had um, uses that were not water dependent, um, but there is a, another category that we were allowed to, to include in our SMP, which we for some reason did not. And so it allows for a slightly reduced setback. I think it was 25 feet for a building like a community center where there are good views of the water and people using that facility can benefit by being near the water. And so that is, is one of the big additions that I'm excited to see in the document. Um, the other, there's some other organizational changes that we made and our old SMP, because it was adopted, it was written in 2011 or 2012 and we did some updates um, in 2016 or 17, but those updates were really targeted at a very few narrow areas. But our old SMP referenced codes that we have since repealed. So when it, it still talked about the downtown overlay district, it still talked about uh, our old zoning code. It talked about our old critical area standards. And so all of the references to other codes have been updated. And um, I think where possible, we are just simply referring to the city's current zoning code rather than giving specific code references in case things change again in the future. Um, but, you know, I think um, those are really the big changes. The, the other thing that you saw several presentations on over the last few months was the sea level rise analysis that was required. And so uh, we have gone through the required exercise of evaluating the potential for sea level rise along our shorelines and including those, uh, those impacts as part of our, uh, our planning document going forward. So um, like I said, this is scheduled to go to the full council in, uh, uh, in a week. And Carrie is going to give a much better presentation than I did because she's, she's been working on this for a year and a half. And, I've, uh, and, and fortunately, she's allowed me to work on other things and not get as involved in this. But uh, I'm happy to attempt any questions that you have about the document or the process. Nick, there's not a lot of uh, a lot of changes. I mean, they're they're not substantial, uh, you know, in comments. Um, my one question is, how often is this um, updated? It's either eight or ten years. I um, eight eight. Okay. Now it's just a curiosity question, but going going through it, it, it looks like as you said, most of these are just changes uh, being made uh, over over time. That's correct. So anyway, um, this will go forward next week and um, 
you, you've got a sneak preview. And if you have any questions before Tuesday, please let us know and we'll try to make sure that we answer those in our, our uh, presentation. And I'm uh, 442 pages down my document right now. I can't see the agenda. I can't remember what item is next. Parks plan updates. All right. I've just got to scroll a little bit further here. Um, so we included the first, I believe it's five chapters of the parks plan that have been drafted by our consultant. And I, I would say these are still very rough draft documents at this point in time. What does the parks uh, plan start on this, Nick? What page number? I, I haven't gotten there yet. I'm, I'm call it out when you get there because I don't want to scroll like you. Is there a is there a part of the packet for it? I don't. Yeah. It's, oh, it, you know what? It it appeared. It appears in the comp plan amendment section. Um, that's why it's not at the bottom. It's uh, at the back. Yeah. It's in the middle. Yes, it's in the it's in the first. Probably thirty percent of the plan, or the packet. It's the one with all the pictures. Page seventy-two, yes. or fifty, or yeah. So I'm, I'm Sorry. not. I did not put it in twice. <laughs> that thank you. So I actually wanted to bring your attention to a particular page where we walk through each of the individual parks because I want to talk to you about the improvements that we seek for our parks. Do you have a page number for us, Nick? Um, I'm working on it. <laughs> Are they the picture pages or what? Ah, there it is. Um, 24 out of 567. Nope. I'm on page 121 out of the packet, and that's page 94 of the parks plan. Okay. Thank you. I've got 121 is the Bethel South property, it says. Correct. That's where I want to start. So, so in this chapter, each park has its own page that provides a map, a couple of photos, and describes the existing improvements as well as possible improvements. And because our contract has the consultant preparing the parks impact fee update, I wanted to go through each of these parks and, and share with you the feedback that I intend to give our consultants so that the next draft we receive is at least closer to the mark in terms of identifying uh, the projects that we would like to have constructed. A few of the parks that are in this plan I'm not even sure that we necessarily want as parks long-term in our city. I, I think that there's a couple that could have uh, better uses that would allow us to, to buy other park property or better park property. And so I think the case in point is the Bethel South property. And when Mayor Mathis was here, I know that this was something he initiated as a comp plan amendment in probably 2013 or 2014, because he wanted to see a dog park developed on this Bethel South property across from Fred Meyer. Um, I'm not sure based on the things that are within walking distance of this property, um, that this is a great site for, uh, a city park. Um, Mark has previously mentioned potentially wanting to develop this as more of a maintenance facility for public works. And so I was hoping to get input from this committee on, you know, what do you see for this property long-term? Is this something that you want to see us investing in? Is this something that could be repurposed? Um, I tend to agree with Mark, unless the Glen Glen Mora project comes through, on the, which is off the to the west of this, which brings a whole bunch of housing. There's nothing out here besides Fred Meyer and a church next door and a com and some commercial businesses. Nick, is, when you opened with this uh, or on this one, you said there were things within walking distance. What what were you specifically referring to? That there's I guess residents within walking distance. You would have to drive to this park. Yeah. And so I'm going to share my screen, actually. Let me. Um, yeah. So, yeah, that I think that, number one, there may be some development near this in the future. I know that Glenmora might go forward, but even Glenmora is going to be a pretty long walk from this facility. Um, and it may be better served by the required open space for that uh, neighborhood when it develops. Uh, I'm just not certain that property on Bethel across from Fred Meyer is the best location for a park. It's a great site for a public works annex, though, because it's right next to our well complex. Uh, that's what's immediately to the west of it. Uh, I, I agree. I, 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 I don't, know, I don't like it, it as a park. Any, does it have any commercial value? The, the frontage. Potentially, yeah. So I, 
I'm not opposed to it being a public's work area, but I'm wondering if there might be more value if it's co yeah. com commercial property. Well, we're um, going to have to buy property to build. We're running out of space at our public works facility. Well, I understand that, but there may be other places that are less. Ex I mean, this is one of the hottest s spots where you have an apartment on the other side of Fred Meyer. I mean, putting a public works thing, I mean, I, I think you could cut that property in half and develop, develop the frontage possibly. Okay. So okay. I think I'm, the discussion here is, is this, should this be a park or not? Not what, how we should develop this piece of property. And oh, I think this is not a good location for a park in my opinion. And I concur with that too. I agree as well. There's okay. not enough parking for it to be a good park currently. Yeah. Um, yeah, you could do a, a, I mean, you could do a pocket park. You could do, I mean, but I agree the location isn't ideal. And, ac and access is horrible. Right. Okay. So the next uh, project, the next property that we own that is on our list, which I did not know we owned until wow. we went through this exercise is, uh, yeah. Yes, and my thought on this, I mean, they're saying possible signage and interpretive trailhead. I don't really see any potential to do anything with this property. Um, I'm not even sure how we came to own it, but my recommendation would be that we just say that this is open space and that's it and leave yeah. it leave it alone. It was dedicated when the Rollins uh, developed the Bravo Terrace. Right. They gave us the, the crap. Actually, how about public works there? It's near the highway. It's, it's, it's a, a wetland. <laughs> There's nothing you can do with that piece of property. <laughs> right. a, lot, a lot of water. Well, the location's nicer. <laughs> All right. So Clayton in Central Park, I know that this is a very popular facility. He has made some recommendations here, and I wanted to truth these with you um, before we... we we are going to be going back out, I believe, with a second round of public outreach to kind of truth everything that is recommended in this. And so I wanted to vet this with, with this committee first. So one of the things that's recommended is removing the fencing along Dwight Street frontage. And um, there actually aren't street names on the map. And I can't remember if Dwight's at the top of the page or the bottom. The bottom. Uh, and, I, okay. and I think something he's sorely missing is our dog park is so well used in McCormick and the counties at Howe. I think on the, we with the fencing that, that we have there, you could easily on that north edge add a dog park into this very easily, a dog park component. Okay. And I, and I agree with virtually all of his other assessments. Um, I use this park all the time. So he talked about a T-ball backstop on the northeast corner. Was that the corner you were talking about? No, you don't want to. Yeah, you don't want to do. You don't want to do baseball in this area. Okay. No. With homes, that in that area, no. we want a dog park there. Yeah, homes with windows. You don't want a baseball. <laughs> no, that's that's a All bad. Right. Um, ADA perimeter trail with fitness stations. Maybe. It's I not, don't know. The park isn't that big. Yeah, exactly. You can walk the community with the sidewalks. Yeah. I don't like that idea there. All right. I'm just, I'm writing down some notes here. And what, what storage shed is he talking about? Uh, I think this one right here. No, that's a picnic shelter. There's no storage shed. Then that's a bathroom. The bathroom needs to be upgraded though. Okay. Hang to on. The new, to the new standard that we're doing. And the picnic shelter needs to be rebuilt. Hey, do you, uh, you know, I used to take kids there to play, but I don't recall seeing a lot of basketball use. Um, uh, fair is there, fair amount. I, is there, come okay. I, I don't, I don't, I'm not married either way. I wouldn't move it though. It's the only flat piece of ground. Right. I agree. To move. Pickleball. It depends on the season, whether or not it's used. Um, yeah. I wouldn't want to live in the house next to it, but I don't. Um, yeah, I, I agree with Fred. Pickleball. So, so that was the recommendation was to move it away from the house. Um, cost prohibitive because of the slope and the ground there. The people okay. in the house haven't complained. All right. I'm just trying to take notes as we go here. Um, uh, so is there um, favor to convert that to a sports court? Here's the challenge of that is it's, graded there and Phil was brought in and off the edges of it is a slope. 
The only way really for it to be an effective sports court or basketball court is to fence it. Because the soon as your ball gets away and it rolls and keeps going. <laughs> mm, okay. So I it need significant upgrades or just be removed. Hmm. I don't, it isn't highly utilized and we've got tennis courts and sports courts at Van Z and Givens. All right. Okay. So the, so, um, as is. yeah, the upgrade to the picnic shelter was that one. Uh, yeah, that's irrelevant. Okay. It's, it's a dog. It leaks. So yeah. you can't sleep. The restaurants need to be rebuilt. All right. Yeah, and, and the restrooms, um, I've got to upgrade the bathroom on there. Yeah. All right. Uh, the next park is DeKalb Pier. I assume that other than having people staying for too long and Mark using his binoculars to look at the window, yeah. we don't have any upgrades needed here. No. All right. Um, is that still closed? Yes, till spring. Is that because people will tie up and, and walk away from boats? And they're, well, the, our homeless population that lives on derelict boats, tell where they row into. Okay. Uh, and leave their dinghies for days on end. Huh. So at a Turner Park, um, the big change here is that our downtown plan is calling for development of the park also on the other side of the stream. And so uh, the eventual development of a park there, I'm identifying as a project that's going to require kind of a master planning and, you know, just put a lump sum of money towards improving that with improvements to be determined. Yeah, and re we're just replicating at a Turner Park on the other side. And Seago talked to me today about putting that on the list for their potential mitigation sites for, for his- I'm, I support that 100%. Yeah. Where do we have an update on uh, Titus Ford? Well, that's why I was asking what, making sure that that property was on Bethel was not being down zoned. Okay. <laughs> All right. Hey, Mayor, Mayor yeah. do we add, would we add lights to this or is that a separate project? Lights for? We talked about before about lighting the bridge at some point in time. Yeah, I thought. that's, you, we've, it's, there's a permit that we have to get. Public Works has all of the materials now and we have to get a shoreline permit and we're gonna lump about $100,000 worth of activity related to benches and the park improvements and the lighting all require this shoreline permit. I didn't know if we just wanted to throw the lighting as a, you know, an improvement, that's all. Oh, okay. well, we're gonna- I'll mention it. We're gonna, yeah. That's all. Okay. It'll All right. The next time the park plan's done, but <laughs> the next park is Givens Field and the Active Club. And other than the tennis courts, I know we talked about resurfacing years ago. I don't know if that was ever completed or not. Wasn't. Needs Didn't to we paint the lines. We repainted the lines. I think. Yeah. Someday it'll need to be resurfaced. Yeah, it's. Uh, I, I was there probably f last time five months ago, and and the surface seemed okay. I think the Van Z surface is in worse shape. Yeah, and it's on. The, it's in the budget. What about? Um, I know this block doesn't have frontage improvements, but that would improve access to the park. Is that something you would want to list? Why not? Yeah, to... I mean, the, the park could use some dressing up. That is for sure. It's it's kind of rough. Um. So any other that he lists the basketball court is upgrading that to a sport court. Is this a more appropriate location for an improvement like that? Yeah. Anything else you can think of? Yeah. If we we're going to overlay those tennis courts, we'd want to make them tennis court slash pickleball courts. Cause that's the more people are. I think just as many people are playing pickleball these days. I don't play either, but I hear it's popular. It's, it's picked up a lot. Yeah. A lot of people bring their own nets. So when we say sports court, and I usually think of basketball and tennis hybrid, but what else is there that is done in a sports court? Uh, that's a good question. I, I'm not sure off the top of my head. Because if we've got tennis and then pickleball. Tennis, pickleball, what, basketball. 
yeah well, the big three right now right what else would we want to do with with this basketball court i mean do we just leave it as is since we've got tennis and pickleball yeah, i think the only capital upgrade because it's really expensive is that to resurface it somewhere in the future <clears throat> to modify it so that it is a pickle it does all of those things and not just tennis yeah okay well um why don't I put a long-term plan not what we're going to accomplish next in the next couple of years is the active club usable yeah okay well when you say usable habitable can can people go in the building is that what you mean yeah i mean is it used and is it in good condition not in good condition okay That's what uh, I it is not being used right now because of covid would, would we ever want to upgrade that building or rehab it or expand it? Um, I think it'd be, it's, it's not worth rehabilitating. We'd need to build a new building there. So do, and if we're building a community center downtown, do we want one there? Good question for the community. Yeah. That's, that's a two, two level building. Is that right? Uh, storage that you look, Pee Wee's uses this bottom of it for storage. Okay. And then the, we use the top, well, the AA groups as the primary users and some, some other various clubs. Yeah, I think a mob's Hitters, club Hitters, used Hitters. it at one point. The bird club. Bird club, yeah. Okay. Right. Well, um, the next park is Lundberg Park. This is another one that is undeveloped and it's one that I don't know if it's in a great location to be developed as a future park. There is going to be a lot more development off of Harold um but it most of this is down in a ravine um i think we've got homeless issues there right now probably and we just cleaned it up one. this week yeah um uh, so uh, is it developable if we sold it yes i think there is the ability to develop um multi-family or single family housing there if i i think it's r3 so there's not, it's not on wetlands. It's hard to tell from the picture. No, it's the sl there's that's sloping down to the, it's the old RV park. It, it slopes uh, east to west is what it looks like. Yeah, I right. think the slope, the break is somewhere kind of yeah. midway through the property. Yeah. The bottom half is not developable, but the top half you could. So, so the eastern part is developable. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, my, my thought is that if we were able to sell this property, we could put that money into other park projects or the community center or other investments in the city. Um, I don't know what it's worth, but. It, it doesn't seem like a, a, a good location for a park, but are there any conditions? Wasn't this deeded to the city with a condition or two? Yeah, or? to research that. Okay. You know, that sounds familiar, um, Council Member Chang. I feel like when. Uh, Where's that another parcel I'm thinking of? Carolyn Powers. Yeah. In, so in our old in our old public properties meeting, I feel like that came up as a discussion item, and there might be a deed restriction. That's on, for sure on the Bethel property that we were talking about earlier. There is? Yeah, there and that is. has a deed restriction. It was gifted. Okay. All right. Um, McCormick Village Park. Um, I, I'm just writing uh, that we have the splash pad project, and that phase three park development needs to be added as the improvements here and get programmed. Um, and that's the phase three is to develop the entrance off of campus parkway and to tie into the other part of the park. Doesn't that include the amphitheater too? Yes, it's a, it's yeah. a second restroom, amphitheater, trailheads, parking. Um, and, you know, McCormick communities in their McCormick master plan in the sub area plan we talked about earlier tonight, they are going to develop some of the parking for an entrance on that side of the park. And so um, mm -hmm. I, I know that they have just today asked us to start negotiating our water system agreement, but that the development agreement isn't limited to one subject. We could consider uh, discussing a park impact fee credit if they were to develop that entrance of the park for us, but it has to be in our plan going forward for them to get a credit. Is that what is a skate dot? I believe it is a, uh, a mini skate park. Okay. Maybe a couple of features for uh, the kids to uh, do their 720s. Yeah, do gnarly things. Do the things I used to do. <laughs> we have such, the county's got such a 
you know, a, a, a great facility. Do we need to, I, you know, I, I question that one. It's, yeah. We did a master plan for McCormick Village Park and it did not include a skateboard feature. Mm-hmm. So I would say let's stick to the master plan yes. and focus on those improvements. Yeah, that could be way, way down the road, if at all. Yeah, yeah. but you know, you're going to have so many people out here. Yeah. At that point in time, I, w- I would keep it listed right now. Mm. I, I, well, I concur, though, with Nick that we, we have a plan that this is a consultant throwing spaghetti at the wall. Mm-hmm. Get a public outreach process and have a plan. Right. Let, let's grab the element, the next element of our plan that's yeah. embedded by the public. That'd be fine. It also doesn't sound very big. It, well, if you look at the park boundary here, the park will extend all the way to Campus Parkway. So they still have, um, they'll still be dedicating additional land to the city and tying that into the, the frontage improvements on Campus Parkway. More trails definitely out there. Yeah, there, there is a trail that comes out right here that yep. goes up to Campus Parkway. So that will be developed as one access point. And then I suspect another access point will be closer to the, the mixed use center. Yeah, that's what they showed before. A lot of people on the north side are using various trails to, to access that. And well, and from, you know, from the various housing developments, by the time it all gets built out, I, I hate to say it, it that park's going to end up being too small. Maybe so. We, we did hear there have been a lot, a lot of parties out on Campus Parkway lately since they started clearing out there. Not me. <laughs> All right, Mitchell Park. This is our, our one bench park uh, along Mitchell that is just a tiny piece of property. Uh, I assume we're not doing anything with Mit- uh, Mitchell Park, although he suggests invasive species removal and extending the ADA path onto the site, which is probably a reasonable thing to do uh, and a required thing to do. Yeah. Um, the old Clifton wetlands, I say leave these alone. They are not there's no way to access these or do anything with them. Um, I didn't even know we owned them. They're also, wow. Okay. You know. All right. Um, Paul Powers Junior Park. Um, his first identified improvement. I stepped, is- I stepped in it last time. That needs to be utilized. I mean, we need to develop a park south of there. And I tried to advocate for that and the neighborhood came out in force in the last park plan update about five years ago. Mm. Uh, but w- it is not accessible. There's no sidewalks to get to the area. There's no parking. It's just, it's not a good park location. And being used as kind of personal dog parks without necessarily the cleanup part is one of, one of the things I recall as well. Yeah. Yeah, so, so it does call for developing a master plan and I would actually say that rather than listing these specific bullets, we should just put kind of a lump sum that says we need to do a master plan and then here's the money to develop that master plan. And it's probably, you know, it's it's smaller than McCormick Village Park, but not by much in terms of the disturbed area. So it's probably a million dollar park when you develop it. Why would we do that if we could develop a better park down at the end around the Are storm we- feature down at the end of uh th- that area and the sydney south i think you you met you answered that question when you opened the discussion of this park saying that you stepped in it last time well i realized that but i didn't have an alternative i, uh, I think where no, i think if you present an alternative it would be a received much more favorably you're right last time it was like oh no one's using this park nobody can see it and it turns out a lot of people in the neighborhood felt very protective of it but I think if there was a better option, they might listen. Um, I was hoping actually that I think what's down at Fireweed was going to be a park because uh, there was so much open space, at least when I, I, I was going to say when I grew up but 20 years ago, but now it's all houses. So, so are, you, are you thinking, Mayor, of the property we're also looking at the stormwater project as doing right. a park? And yeah, yeah okay. I, I think we need, a, we need a million dollar park in this area. And it could be this site or it could be where the property that we acquire for the stormwater pond down at, at farther south. Okay. So that well, this area deserves a park and a nice park. And if it has to be here, it has to be here. But if we're able to acquire another piece of property 
I think we could be better served. We could better serve the community. Okay. Maybe we, um, maybe we put them both in at a half a million dollars and we shift things around depending on yeah. you know, our future. I, and we also, I, I assume that at some point we're going to target a desired impact fee. And so I've heard the number $2,500 per home park impact fee. And we may need to add both parks to get there, or we may need to subtract a park to get to that level. So let's, let's remain flexible on that and kind of let our funding uh, help us with that decision. Mayor, what was the cost, excluding the, you know, what's happening with the splash pad, what's the, what was the cost of the build out of McCarn? I think it was one six. One six, okay. Well, it, it was two phases. So phase two was 1.6. Phase one just went in and cleared and put in the bathroom and not a whole lot else. Okay. Yeah. And was, we kind of did some trade for logging in that clearing effort. So we, we had some minimal, maybe a hundred grand, a couple hundred grand. No, I was just wondering when you say a million dollar park, what, you know, what, trying to equate it to something so that helps thank you yeah i think rockwell was what about 275 or 300 uh no mm. we spent about a half a million yeah. did we okay that makes more sense. So, yeah that was in the fours all right so rockwell oh, I, park oh go ahead i was just gonna say I, I like the idea of at this point kind of splitting the baby on that because um i get it i also get that even if i think we were to propose another park location you still would have the in my backyarders saying um, or, or opposing a move or uh, development elsewhere, but maybe just splitting it at, at this time is the way to go. Right. You, you know, another thought because that Flower Meadows area and the Stormwater Park is so isolated and the roads are so bad to get there right now. Um, one, you know, typically we require improvements. If, if the transportation infrastructure is not good enough to get to a park, that infrastructure could be part of the park project. So maybe that's a way to, to help fix kind of the roads at the end of that area to, to make access in and out better with the park. But then it's a $5 million park, not a, right. not a $1 million park. <laughs> so Rockwell Park, I, as far as I'm concerned, this park is finished. Um, nothing else is needed. Home run. Well, it's amazing to, to look at the uh, before and afters on this. Yeah, we right. need an after picture there. <laughs> yeah, I, I I did note that in my comments back to him that we need an updated photo because mm -hmm. this is... Uh, It'd be, be great to get one with the drone. <laughs> we, we've got... Uh, the county has updated aerial photos. It's just whatever source he was using for his photo is older. Mm -hmm. uh, the Seattle Avenue property, this is down in the ravine. I assume we don't want to do anything here. Right. So these are these definitely have restrictions. We can't sell them. I guess we can't. You can't build on them. They're, they're in the ravine. Yeah, I think we're stuck with them. I don't think anybody would buy it from us. Sutton Lane. Hmm. Then Van Z Park. Um, he talked about expanding the trail around the perimeter. I don't know that there's much room to do that. Um, upgrading playground. Uh, striping the tennis courts for pickleball. Where's the playground? Uh, next to the bathroom, or no, next to the old bathrooms. Is it at this entrance or up above? No, it's it's somewhat central, but to the west a little bit. You I can kind of see the corner of a pad. No, uh, this that's our well, that's our well equipment. This is our. Um... No, there's a swing set there, and and okay. uh, a little fire pit. Okay. Hmm. So. That's pro I think the descriptions here are probably pretty good, making the, the sport court for pickleball and tennis. Yeah. Um, my, my thought was that this is not big enough for a full-time, a full-size athletic field, but we have the lights there. Would we want to consider putting in a, a multi or all-season surface for athletics there where kids can practice and you know do more pickup games or, or young kid games as opposed to a full-size field? When are you, you say all-season, is that a turf? Yeah, like a field turf okay. surface. I know that, you know, in my neighborhood here in Tacoma, the elementary school put in, in their playground, a, a mini field turf area. And it seems like something that size would be really good here because it, it gives you all year use. And we have teams that are constantly wanting to use that facility. Yeah. That, where do they good. park? What's that? Where do they park? Do they park on the south end? Are those boundaries wrong? Because yeah, uh, that, that's part of the park, isn't it? That's yes, the parking area. Yeah. Right. Yeah, you're right. They park next to the tennis courts. Yes, that's the other spot. There's two parking lots. Oh, that's right. Yeah, there's one above. Um, you know, yeah. no, I, 
I like the idea of uh, a turf uh, field. Um, I know that as part of our spring cleanup, we came in and, and helped to replant this, but it didn't take very well. Um, yeah. Drainage issues there. Yeah, it's a little rough. There's some drainage issues. Um, while I'm thinking about it, uh, since we've got some snow coming up, I remember last year there was a kid that slid into a post down there near the bottom. We should probably look at stuff like that. Hmm. Um, and then this was also the area where we had uh, some pickleball reps come and talk to us about um, striping the courts. Yeah, we're, we're already doing that. That's in yeah. this budget. Okay. We're going to we're, we're gonna resurface and stripe them and replace the nets. Okay. And then when I have, I have a bench that we're going to repurpose on the waterfront, that's it, going to get put here. I see everybody bringing their folding chairs all the time up to that park. We need some benches. And it's pretty, you probably already know this, but it's pretty popular for disc golf. Yes. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So I don't think, yeah, I, I like what everything I'm hearing. All right. The next park that this is a public park that we took in, it's near um, Pottery, uh, the Windfall Place subdivision. This, this park's in pretty sad shape. It probably needs irrigation and a, a better toy it's it's a neighborhood pocket park but it's also public and so i think the question is you know it's not ada accessible right now it it needs upgrades and it is in an area that doesn't i guess van z is the closest park um but this is walking distance to a fair number of people is this something we would want to look at upgrading probably should yeah if we, own it, with... we need to upgrade it <laughs> Yeah. We put everything on the list, and then we pair the list down when the if the number's too big. Right, a, I'm not sure it's a high priority though. Yeah, yeah, and maintenance where we're not adding capacity to a park, those types of improvements are not necessarily in, eligible for impact fees. We have to actually be adding something that is uh, increasing our capacity for for parks and recreation in the city. So when you build a picnic shelter, that's eligible, but if you replace a picnic shelter, that's not. Mm. Okay. All right, so the last part of this I wanted to talk about, which is not in, well, I guess I forgot Bay Street Pedestrian Path is here. I, I will, uh, I am recommending we put the pathway in just so we have, mm -hmm. we can make park impact fee dollars eligible to help match the remaining <coughs> rents. Um, but downtown, obviously the, the downtown sub area plan, we have identified at least five different parks. One of them is the expansion of Etta Turner on the west side of the creek, but the Orchard Street Plaza, the Port Street Plaza, the Prospect Street Hill Climb, um, the waterfront restoration between where the Kitsap Bank is now, those are all possible park projects that would be new parks and would be eligible for park impact fee funding. And so I'm proposing that we include those in the um, in the parks plan as new park facilities. And I realize it's it's a lot of investment downtown, um, but I think that this is one of the few revenue sources we can, we can add uh, that doesn't impact our existing residents that will help pay for this master plan and implementation of the master plan. So I wanted to run that by all of you. Also, I know the mayor, mayor, you've talked about the waterfront park expansion and potentially taking an additional 15 feet out of the parking lot at Waterfront Park where we control the land. And so that's a potential park project downtown as well. Yeah, it's, yeah, next to the, a little bit there and then along the pathway too, to make it a little greener along the edge of the pathway, so. Right, so that would be under a separate page because that's gonna be the city of Port Orchard Waterfront Park as opposed to the Port of Bremerton Waterfront Park. So th those were the additions that I had that all of those need to be master planned and we would just put a, a planning budget and then a lump sum development budget for each of those that's, that's really just a wag, as Mark likes to say. And, um, and that way we can, we can start raising impact fee dollars to help pay for building those. Um, finally, the, the only other issue I saw was I know the county proposed or asked us if we would take Veterans Park and I know that we said no. And so I'm just curious if, if any discussion of Veterans Park needs to take place in terms of that potentially becoming a city facility. Well, 
is it going to hurt for us to analyze what it needs? No, and I, I don't even think it would hurt for us to plan for it because ultimately yeah. we, we, they can't require the council to accept it. So, yeah, I think if we asked a parks and rec divi uh, division and had dedicated staff to, to maintain these facilities, I'd love to have that in the city. It's a problem uh, area in our city because the county allows homelessness camping in, in that park. And, and it's a, a lot, yeah. We get a lot of complaints about that, and it's a <laughs> county park. And if we, uh, you know, if we had a dedicated funding source for it, I'd love to have all those fields and amenities in our city. Yeah. So the um, we did analyze the county facilities in the vicinity of Port Orchard for the purpose of of figuring out our level of service, but it's still listed as a, a county park. So. It's in here right now. It talks about picnic shelter, playground, ADA, skate dot, soccer fields, uh, sport I mean, court. This guy's obsession with skate dots. <laughs> <laughs> it's got them on every park. <laughs> I saw that. It's all the uh, They're really pot. The guys are really popular. And if you guys remember how long it took to actually get one built. That's uh, not a skate dot, though. That's a real. No, full I know. That. But I mean, if, if it was even. You know, a third of that, you know, dot it, it, it would bring people. Yeah, I agree. There would be kids there 20, you know, as long as it's not raining, they're going to be out there hanging out. I'd like to see one. Um, so are we still talking about veterans? Sorry, I had a phone call that I had to um, cut out. Yeah. So just, I think the question is, do we want to potentially include this as we can plan it as a city park, but there's no obligation for the city to accept it. Um, I don't know if, if including it in our, in our plan would would nudge the county in the direction of trying to surplus it and, and saying, hey, this is going to go away if you don't take it. But Well, that, that would be, yeah, that would be the uh, discussion point is if we don't, it gets surplused and then developed. Um, You'd hate to lose it, but at the same time, we can't afford it right now. Right. I, you know, one of the thoughts I had about Veterans Park, too, I don't remember if I discussed this with the committee, but I think there's the potential along Mile Hill that there could be some limited development. And so you could carve off a piece of that to develop it and help pay for the improvement of the rest of the park. Um, so that's that's I wondered one about that. Okay. Yeah. So there's no deed restriction. Well, we'd have to look into that further, but not that we know of. I don't want to throw it out the window yet myself, but I, I, we can't afford it without a parks and recs division or a plan of some sort to pay, pay for it. Cause it's, it's that there's a couple of employees right there. Yep. Yeah. For that one. Well, for, for all of these, I think uh, even some of these smaller improvements are going to definitely uh, require additional help. So, okay, well, that's that's all I wanted to go over with the parks plan right now. Obviously, there's you're getting a, a little bit of a sneak preview on our working draft, but um, a, a more refined version should be out soon. I think Carrie and I have a meeting with the consultant next week, and then hopefully towards the end of the month or early March, we will have a, a draft for public release. Um, and, and I think there is another opportunity for public participation. I just don't know whether that occurs before the draft release or after the draft release. And that's all I've got tonight. Although we did skip the first agenda item, which was uh, deciding who the chair of the meeting will be going forward. Oh, I'm, happy, I'm happy to pass the baton as Fred called it. <laughs> Dick and I are ineligible. So you guys want to do rock, <laughs> paper, scissors or whatever. Would you like to be chair? I will, I will, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll do it. I still have so much to learn, Jesus Pete. It's loads of fun. All right. Well, that do, do I put Nick on speed dial? <laughs> He's not laughing. <laughs> put Carrie on speed dial, or um, hopefully ah. after after we talk to the finance committee, we may we may have to put our intern in charge of this one. I'm not sure. Okay. Oh, great. <laughs> So what our next meeting then is March 10th. It's a month from now. Yeah, Wednesday is at 4 30. 
Well, and actually, I needed to mention that I am um, I'm going to potentially have a conflict. My uh, my adult sports are potentially resuming in March, and I'm I'm thinking about it. I'm not committed to it yet, but um, so I may not have a whole lot of time for these meetings. Uh, I could probably do an hour, but more than an hour is going to be tough for me on Wednesdays, starting uh, hopefully in the not so distant future. I think I'll be okay for March, though. Yes, we're going to go March tenth. Then let's go March tenth, four thirty. Yeah, if, if possible, if we could do four o'clock in the future, that would give me enough of a cushion if if things run late. But I know Scott that you have uh, uh, work commitments as well, so I don't know how how flexible you. You can be. I'm I'm flexible so long as it's known in advance. I could do a four o'clock. Okay. You want to do March tenth, four o'clock? Uh, no, I have a I have a, a second Wednesday three thirty meeting that I got out early of to make this one. Okay. Um, so it would be hard. <laughs> um, I'm open to another day like Thursday. Is, did, would that work or not for anyone? Yeah, I, a Thursday works for me if we wanted to do a, a late afternoon meeting. Um, I could but... go earlier on that, you know, or another day. Um, maybe you discuss it at the March 10th. Or... Yeah, March yeah, 10th. Let's go March 10th right now, 4.30, and we'll discuss, see where we go from there. All right, thank you. Okay. And this can okay. close the meeting then. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thanks. Thank you.